So uh, some of you are familiar with me, so some of you are not, which means you're probably not familiar with our ministry, but uh, CMI, Creation Ministries International. We are truly international. We have offices actually in seven countries around the world. And I now live in Atlanta, Georgia, which is our US head office. We, we chose that mainly because of the airport hub, uh, because our ministry, our focus of our ministry is going actually to churches where believers are. You're probably aware we're, we've got a problem with the exodus, exodus of our youth in church, and uh, we've undertaken specific surveys, questioning them as to their number one reason. Now, there are lots of reasons, right? Don't get me wrong, but their number one reason is the authority of Scripture. The Bible's wrong. And which book do you think comes most under attack? The book of Genesis. Evolution is true. I interviewed hundreds and hundreds of students, and I'm going to talk about it later in a film documentary survey. And out of the hundreds I interviewed, only five, and these were students who professed that they were raised in Christian homes, only five still believed in biblical creation. And the simple reason is because the majority of us, our children, have all been educated in the secular realm. They've all been taught evolution as a fact. And to be very blunt, we kind of think that an hour on Sunday morning is going to compete with you know, 35 hours a week of evolutionary indoctrination. It's in virtually every subject, and it's even taught, obviously, at elementary age now. So it's our job as believers and parents, and even grandparents, to get information out. That's why our ministry heavily focuses on resources, to get them into believers' hands. Last year, myself and my seven other speakers in the Atlanta office spoke in 334 churches across the United States. Okay, so every weekend, like this weekend, my speakers are out going to churches where believers are, making them aware of those issues so they can get information into their homes. Uh, the handful of kids that still believed in creation, by the way, a common denominator, every single one of them had been exposed to creation teaching while still at home. It made, made the big difference. So no secret why I think this ministry is foundational and important. So uh, we have a website, uh, fully, uh, fully operational. There's over 12,500 articles on there. Uh, that's about 42 years worth of creation research, which is how long CMI has been in operation under a couple of different names in the past. The lead article changes daily. You can search on the search engine there, type in your favorite questions. Here's the web address. Pretty difficult web address to remember, isn't it? <laughs> So usually we're always trying to respond to claims in the media when they happen. Uh, we get hundreds of emails every week, a full-time information officer. All those questions are sent to our scientists and specialists and we answer every single one. So uh, your support for our ministry would be very much appreciated. All of that uh, obviously is a, a lot of work. Um, we're gonna do something uh, in the meeting to save you some time. We have a free email news and we try to only send it out to answer those claims in the media. So I'll give you an example. There's some exciting stuff. Uh, I could give you lots of examples, but here's a few years ago, they found 80 whales in the middle of a South American desert. 20 of them are perfectly preserved. Now I say to people when I go out to churches, I say, how did 20 whales, some of them perfectly preserved and fossilized, end up in the middle of a very, very dry desert in South America. How did that happen? Just to get people thinking, I say, well, is there anything in the Bible's history you think that could explain that? And then people shout out the flood, you see? We've got to get people thinking about Bible first, the Bible's history to explain the world around us. So that's the type of stuff that we try to uh, link people to. Uh, my volunteer Dan's going to come forward in a moment. If you want to get our free email news, he's going to pass some sign-up sheets. And if you can just pass them along and then backwards one row, we're going to go every second row and hold them up at the end and he'll grab them off you. All I need is your name, your email address and your zip code. It links you with those articles. But also when uh, any of our speakers are in your area, it'll also notify you about that. So now for something completely different. Okay, so uh, not many creationists. Your magazine. Did you mention your magazine? No, I'll get to that. Oh, okay. That's all right. Don't worry. It's the best part. I know. That's all right. I've been doing it a while. Don't worry. <laughs> so we're going to talk about my book. This was my first book released in 2005. 
Uh, it's actually in its eighth printing. And we don't mention it's been an Amazon top 50 bestseller to boast, but to actually kind of point out we believe, and I think it's indicative from the emails I get, more non-Christians have read this book than Christians. Sci-fi, as you're going to see, this type of subject matter uh, is huge. And it's even invading now the popular scientists, so the, the popular sciences, etc. Let me tell you a funny little story. In fact, that sticker there is a ministry here in the US. You can get those, uh, this no alien symbol for free. You can put it on your car. And I had one on my car in my first book tour back in 2005 here in the US. I was still living in Australia at the time. And uh, I parked at a local shopping mall. And it was one of these multi-story car parks, you know, where the, you know, your tyres squeal when you turn and that type of stuff. And I parked my car and I was walking towards the mall entrance. And this voice across the car park, really echoey, Oi, mate, you, stop, stop. And I looked around at, with about a dozen other people and he started pointing his finger and running at us. I thought, hello, did I cut him off at a stop sign? And I was kind of bracing myself as I've done something wrong. And breathlessly, in the middle of a shopping mall car park, he ran up to me and he said, I saw that sticker on your car. Where do you think aliens come from? Notice he didn't say, where do they exist? Where do they come from? Survey shows that most people, including Christians, believe that there's life out there on other planets. So one of the reasons I, I wrote about this is I was a bit of a sci-fi fan and our ministry had not, no creation ministry, no Christian ministry really dealt with the subject, so it was a new area of endeavour to answer these pop culture type questions. And so as an example, I said to him, I said, well, do you know there's about 150 UFO sightings every single day, but no two UFOs have ever appeared exactly alike? He said, I didn't know that. I said, yeah, I said, they've been seen to fly at incredible speeds, merge into one another. I said, and then there are people that claim alien abductions. They say the aliens pass through the walls and the ceilings, and then they get taken up onto the spaceship through the walls and the ceilings. And he's sitting there with his mouth open saying, man, I've never heard that stuff. Just like you, you never heard that stuff. And he said, how come you know so much? <laughs> and I said, well, I just happened to have written a book on the subject. And then I sold him a copy. But anyway. <laughs> So let's, uh, let, let's uh, get in a little bit in depth. I'm probably going to talk a little bit more uh, than an hour because I want to cover some creation uh, evolution aspects. But you probably remember this man, Carl Sagan, deceased now. At the time uh, when he was alive, he wrote the world's largest selling science book. And uh, he even went on to write uh, or, uh, uh, science fiction novels, which became major movies. Sagan was an atheist, a materialist, not as in, not not as in uh, you know, wealth or acquiring material gains, but matter is all there ever was, ever will be, etc., like he says there. And uh, well, for guys like Sagan, okay, there are only really two explanations about how life got here on the earth, the, s the same way that you and I think, uh, but they extrapolate that out to the universe. If life evolved on the earth, it must have evolved countless times over in a billions of years old universe. For materialists like him though, the origin of life is a mystery. And you'll see where I'm going with this. So we understand, okay, as Bible believers, that life is the result of complex design. You know, Darwin really knew nothing about the complexity of the cell. Studying cell biology today is like information technology. All living creatures in their cells have at their nucleus, the DNA molecule. In fact, just got a great article today where Israeli scientists for the first time have been able to store data on DNA artificially. So there you go. The compression rates are incredible and it screams design. Now, in my book, I covered the aspect that now many scientists believe that aliens may have created life on Earth. If you remember years ago, Richard Dawkins was challenged at the end of that Expelled movie He's the guy that wrote The Blind Watchmaker, but when pressed, he said, well, maybe aliens created life on Earth. You see? It's not about science, is it? It's never about science. It's just simple. It's about whether there's a God or not. So he's happy to attribute design and creation on the Earth to unseen aliens, but of course it can't be the God of the Bible. So I just want to cover this uh, aspect of whether that's possible, because if uh, if aliens created life on Earth, you know, seeded life on Earth 
millions or billions of years ago, like Francis Crick, one of the co-discoverers of the DNA molecule there, that's the guy seated. You know, years ago, he wrote, I mean, I, by the way, what is it now, 60 years ago, they, they uh, discovered the DNA molecule. But he was an ardent atheist. He said one of the reasons he entered the sciences was to disprove the notion of a supernatural creator. So over 60 years ago, Crick came up with the idea that aliens may have created life on Earth. It's nothing new. But let's look at that, because they've still got the same fundamental uh, problems. So I said all life is based upon information. Evolution says that in the beginning, in a warm pond about three billion years ago, the first chemicals got together to form the first amino acids, the first proteins, the first cell, and all life somehow since then has spontaneously generated to become horses and human beings, etc. So you have to add encyclopedias worth of information, right, to get increasing complexity. In human beings, we've got about three billion letters in our DNA. The simplest organism on the earth, I think, is a bacterium, has about 580,000 letters, mycoplasma. So, and the reason I'm telling you this, the number one, one of the number one stumbling blocks I found in all my years of ministry for teens and youngsters going through college is this is what they hear. Their lecturers say, creatures change over time. Therefore, evolution is true. Look, dogs change. Look at all the varieties of horses. You can see it with your own eyes. See, evolution is true. That's known as a bait and switch. And I tell you, if I had a dollar for every teen in churches where I've come up and want to argue with me about natural selection being real, right? And I say, yes, it is real. And they say, well, therefore, you must believe in evolution. <laughs> okay? Let's look at it. Because could life have started by chance or could aliens have seeded some simple life on Earth? Very simple illustrations I'm going to show you. And I encourage you to use something like this if you're talking to people about <laughs> natural selection. Uh, natural selection is part of the creation model. And I'm going to use dogs. Uh, we all understand dogs. We understand how we can artificially select dogs or breed dogs for certain traits. Darwin himself was a pigeon breeder. So he should have known there were always limits to the change. So imagine here I've got uh, a, parent, uh, a pair of parent dogs. And I want you to imagine their fur length is in the medium range. Okay, medium length fur. Now why? Well, over here, simply represented, Dad, he's got a gene, in other words, a, a, a set of instructions that says make short fur. He's got a gene that says make long fur. He's got all the genetic information necessary to produce differing uh, lengths of off, uh, fur in his offspring. Mum's got the same, gene for short fur, gene for long fur. So when they get married and they walk down the aisle and they have puppies, they can produce dogs with short fur. Why is that? Well, you remember from our biology classes, right? We get one set of instructions from each of our parents. So he inherited the short fur gene from dad, short fur gene from mum, okay? And then you can get dogs in the medium range like mum and dad, short fur gene from dad, long fur gene from mum, maybe vice versa, long fur gene from dad, short fur gene from mum. Different combination, but they're still expressed in the medium range. And then you get this guy here. So what happened there? <laughs> Well, she only inherited the set of instructions for long fur from each of her parents. But have a look, ladies and gentlemen, we've got change in one generation. It's happened very quickly. But here's the kicker. Has anything new been created? No. All that we've got is a resorting of pre-existing information that had to be present in the parents. Now, when we take dogs, we've got a population of dogs ranging from short, medium to long fur and we stick them in the freezing wild, you know, uh, outback of northern Illinois or Alaska. <laughs> it's cold to an Australian anyway. But uh, which dogs would have a survival advantage in cold climates? Long fur. So nature selects. Aha. Now Christians get themselves into knots over that. It's just a convenient term to describe what we see occurring in nature. Nature's not some conscious living entity that can think. Creatures without a, without, a, without a favorable survival trait will get culled from the population. So we knock out short and medium fur dogs, and then only the dogs with long fur now survive. Now what will happen when they reproduce? They're only going to reproduce dogs with long fur. So the first thing we learned was, okay, all that was happening was it was a selection from pre-existing 
information, but there's a massive problem for evolution, whether it's natural or what's called directed panspermia, alien seeding life on Earth, we've now lost genetic information. Can you see that? We've lost the genes for short and medium fur. It's the opposite of what evolution requires. This is so simple to understand. In Evolution's Achilles Heels that uh, Ken mentioned out there, there's a DVD, 15 PhDs who were experts in the very fields like radiometric dating and biology who say this is what evolution predicts but we do not see it occurring in nature. Natural selection cannot produce anything new, it can only select from what's already available. That's why I said it's a validation of the creation model. And then the other term the youngsters get hooked up on is, well, we're told we see new species. Heard that? New species. And again, the idea is something new is being produced. Well, you can keep selecting down and selecting down and narrowing the genetic information so they'll no longer interbreed with the parent population they come from. Lions and tigers have been called separate species, but every member of the cat family can actually interbreed. The term species is very fluid. Ask any biologist, you'll get a, a dozen different interpretations about what a species is. So again, that's another man-made term like natural selection. There's a, an example of what happens if you inbreed too much, all right? <laughs> It's an inbred dog for you. The Bible doesn't use the term species. The Bible uses the term kinds, after his kind, after their kind. Ten times that's mentioned in Genesis chapter 1. We see complexity. The most complex information storage mechanism in the known universe is the DNA molecule. And uh, atheist professor Paul Davies, he even admitted this. He said, how did stupid atoms spontaneously write their own software. Nobody knows, there is no lo known laws of physics able to create information from nothing. I'll give an example of what he means. I'll take my book here. If I show you the letters on the page, are the letters information? Trick question, no they're not. They're letters. The letters have to be arranged into words and sentences to produce a code, a complex information code that you and I have been taught to understand. Randomness does not give us this type of complexity. And when we look at the DNA molecule, again, it's the, the code on there. I mean, it's taken us years to unravel it and we still don't know everything that it does. You know, remember the junk DNA paradigm? 98% <laughs> of our DNA is an evolutionary leftover vestige. I, to be very frank with you, that was incredibly arrogant. They just said that because they didn't understand what it did. We now know there is absolutely no junk in our DNA. It codes for all sorts of things besides proteins, etc. So, as this guy says, uh, as I said earlier, if earthlings didn't believe in evolution, he says, I wouldn't exist. And of course, the other view is, well, maybe God created life out there. And surprisingly, most, and it's a big statement, but most Christians have no problem with that. I'm going to deal with that as the very last subject because it's potentially the most controversial. But let me give you an example. I went to my first UFO conference many years ago and I started researching this and the UFO investigator giving a lecture, he stood up and he says, we know the great cosmic science experiment worked. Evolution. Here we are. You and I are proof that it happened. And he said, in a 14 billion year old universe as specified by the Big Bang, there could be alien races out there a million or billion years older than us on the evolutionary scale. So just imagine they could be a million or billion years advanced in their technology and that's how come they can build hyperdrive or warp, warp drive spaceships, visit the Earth, the type of stuff you see in Star Trek, etc. So let's think about that. Uh, something we focus on a lot is teaching people that evolution is not science, neither is creation. Okay? When you talk about science, I say to people, what do you commonly think of or understand? People think about, well, what about gravity? Things you can see, observe, test, repeat. What about the idea that, you know, dinosaurs evolved into birds 65 million years ago? Evolution is full of these one-time events, allegedly, right, that no one ever saw. You can't repeat them. Remember what I said with evolution's Achilles heels? We do not see them happening today. It's not science, okay? Both evolution and creation are belief systems about the past.
But let's take a look at the Big Bang. A lot of Christians say, well, I think God could have used the Big Bang. Uh, no, he didn't. That's part of the uh, evolutionary uh, model. But um, let, me, let me give you kind of a condensed potted version of the Big Bang. It's a bit hard to understand because they say, in the beginning there was nothing. And when we say nothing, we mean nothing. There's no atoms, there's no matter, there's not even empty space, there's just nothing. It's a little bit hard for you and I to comprehend, isn't it? Because we live in a physical space-time universe. It's hard to be, understand anything that might be beyond our realm. But in this nothingness, they say a little kernel of energy, no bigger than the head of a pin, popped into existence. They call that a quantum fluctuation. All right? And in this pinhead's worth of energy, it's about to become everything in the universe. Matter, time and space. And it was Fred Hoyle, the scientist, who derisively called that the Big Bang. And in case you think I'm being unfair, the father of the inflation theory of the Big Bang is a man by the name of Professor Alan Guff. And summarising his work in Discover magazine, they said this, the universe burst into something from absolutely nothing, zero nada, and as it got bigger, it became filled with even more stuff that came from absolutely nowhere. So there you go. That's in a scientific magazine, by the way. Let me get this straight. First there was nothing and then it exploded. <laughs> now I'm not saying this to ridicule, but you know so often Christians and creationists, the skeptics love to have a go at us and say, well you just always resort to the supernatural. You just always say God did it. But evolution is full of supernatural events. That's why I focused on it at the beginning. We don't see them, we don't observe them. They believe that once upon a time these things must have happened. Okay. You can't, guess what, with a big bang, you can't observe it, you can't repeat it, you can't test it, okay? Does not fall under what we commonly understand as science. Now for me personally, one of the most profound passages in all of scripture is this one. It sets it up, doesn't it? For, when you think about it, for everything that's to come, it's, you know, we just take it for granted, but right on the first verse, it's telling us, there's God, and he created the heavens and the earth. Now one of the most asked questions by teens I get, and I've got a DVD added on there as well, if God's a creator who made God. Skeptics love to show that as well. Well let's break this down a little bit. So it gives us the answer that God was there before he made the heavens and the earth. How can that be? Well there's something known as the law of causality and it kind of goes like this. It says everything which has a beginning must have a cause. Everything which has a beginning must have a cause. And so let's think about our universe. Well, let's think about the concept of time. How do we measure time? Well, here on the Earth, in our little section of the solar system, the Earth rotates and the Sun, and we call that a day. If you lived on another planet like Venus, I think Venus has something like the equivalent of 230 Earth days for, for one of their days, something like that. So you see, we measure time dependent upon our framework of reference. But before there was any universe, right, whether you're a creationist or a big banger, okay, there was no time. Time is a created entity. It began when the universe came into being. But the Bible's telling us there's God. Now, the, the evolutionists have the same law of causality problem because how did nothing become everything? What, what caused that first quantum fluctuation to come out of nothing? So they're actually violating, by believing in a Big Bang, the very you know, supposed scientific laws they appeal to when they criticise Christians for believing in God. By the way, the Bible says God inhabits eternity. You know, as a young Christian, I used to think about eternity. Well, maybe that's billions of years in the past and billions of years in the future. But if God pre-existed the universe that he made, guess what? He does not exist in time, as you and I understand it. He is timeless. Okay, if he made the universe, he's not bound by the laws of physics that he created. That's why he says there is none like him. He is absolutely unique. By the way, that means he, if he doesn't have a beginning in time, he doesn't need a cause. See, those things only apply in our physical space-time universe. All right, well, the, as I said, the Big Bang is central uh, for the uh, idea of evolution of life 
occurring all over the universe. Now I'm a bit of a space junkie, I confess. Uh, when I moved to the US, I've been to Huntsville in Alabama, I've been to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida several times. You know, Apollo 17, we've just celebrated the, uh, the uh, uh, 50th anniversary of the moon landings, but uh, they were due to go up into the 20s and they ceased with Apollo 17. And this man took over NASA, Dan Golden, and he tried to reinvent them. Remember, public interest was waning. It was boring landing on the moon. And he, he started what's, or launched what's called the Origins Program. And part of the Origins Program, they started a new field of scientific endeavor called astrobiology. And astrobiology specifically, if you look at their definition, is to look for the evolution of life wherever it might be occurring in the universe. And you can see one of their goals he listed was to search for Earth-like planets that may be habitable or inhabited. If you Star Wars fans, sounds like he's going to look for Obi-Wan Kenobi sitting in a cave in Tatooine there, doesn't it? But uh, they're looking for basically water. That's their main goal. Uh, on Mars, they're all excited because they think there's water there. I think there probably is. Um, but uh, lo life is a lot more complex than just H2O, isn't it? So the stuff we see, which is really what gets people kick-started in this, is what we see in those science fiction movies. You know, people flying around, aliens in their hyperdrive spaceships, traveling all over our galaxy, uh, etc. That's kind of known as the extraterrestrial hypothesis, or the ETH. And it became really popular in the 50s and the 60s. Remember all those B-grade science fiction movies? Okay. But as our understanding about the size of the universe has increased, we now know, it's obvious, that aliens could not travel thousands or millions of light years you know, across our galaxy or even the universe to, to get here or to other planets. <coughs> now, this is a, an area people argue about. They say, well, you can't say that, Gary, because you know, 100 years ago we thought we'd never go to the moon, or in the future you don't know what technologies we have, and that's true. But I'm going to show you, to get around at the speeds necessary in our own lifetimes, it is going to be impossible. So I want you to think about our Milky Way galaxy, by the way. It's 100,000 light years across. That's just one galaxy. Our, our sun is but one star in the Milky Way. We estimate there might be two billion stars like our Milky Way. And keep in mind, the speed of uh, light is 186,000 miles per second. So if you could travel at 186,000 miles per second, it would take you 100,000 years just across our Milky Way galaxy. Of course, unless you've got one of these babies, right? So uh, here we'll find out how many closet trekkies here. Where are you? There they are. There's a handful. They're always in every meeting. <laughs> Live long and prosper. Can you do that yet? All right, okay. So uh, let's look at this. As I said, I've been to the Kennedy Space Center. The uh, Saturn V rockets that took man to the moon and the space shuttle are the most powerful vehicles that mankind has ever built. But at the best speed of Apollo, okay, it would take you 870,000 years to reach the next star to our own sun in our own Milky Way. Proxima Centauri, about 4.3 uh, light years away. That's at the fastest we can produce now. See, there are physical problems. You've virtually got to overcome the laws of physics, and you can't do that. You can't you know, build anti-gravity craft because you can't switch off the Earth's gravity. You can build more and more powerful craft to escape gravity, but when you do, you're going to create a whole bunch of other problems. I want you to imagine you had something the size of a softball, okay? And we're going to accelerate that to just half the speed of light, represented by the letter C, it would take you the energy equivalence of 98 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs just to accelerate that to half the speed of light, something the size of a ball. Now when you get going in the vacuum of space, you're going to keep going at that speed. So when you get to your destination, you've got to use the same energy requirements to slow yourself down. So we've just doubled them. But you know, after you've been on that distant planet for a while, guys, we want to get back and see the wife and the kids, so we've got to speed back up again and then when we get to the Earth, we've got to slow ourselves down. So every return trip requires a fourfold input, okay, of that incredible energy. Uh, look at this. At half the speed of light, it would take you four million years to reach Andromeda, the next galaxy closest to our own Milky Way. 
Other problems, space is not empty. It's full of stuff, cosmic dust. Okay, and it's estimated there's about 100,000 dust particles for every cubic kilometre of space. And even one-tenth of the speed of light, uh, an impact with a grain of dust would be like 10 tonnes of TNT impacting your spaceship. Now, if you watch Star Trek and science fiction, they've got these great gizmos called deflector arrays. They're basically like force fields. But you've got to use the same equally opposing force to deflect that. So you, now you've just added to the energy requirements of your spacecraft. Uh, for, for example, here's a pa couple of panels off the Hubble Space Telescope. Now this guy just sits in geosynchronous orbit, matching the Earth's rotation. Nowhere near fast enough you need to get around uh, our galaxy. But can you see the impact marks? Now they don't do any damage, but that just shows you how much dust and particles there are uh, in space. Here's uh, the window of the former Space Shuttle Challenger. And this was impacted by a flake of paint, 0.2 of a millimetre in size. That's the fraction, a fraction of the size of a pinhead. And look at the damage it caused to the window. And that's going relatively slow in terms of the speeds we're talking about for aliens to get around the place, right? Other problems, G-forces. We measure gravity here on Earth as 1G. If you're on Jupiter, more mass, more gravity. Um, so, uh, you know, 9Gs, if you kept that going for a while, Air Force pilots, so jet fighter pilots, when they do high-speed turns, they wear pressure suits, they undergo training, trying to constrict their muscles to reduce their blood flow. But if you pulled 9Gs for even a few seconds, you would black out. And, you know, on Star Trek, Captain Jean-Luc Picard sits there and says, make it so, in that lovely British accent, and they jump into Warp Factor 9, and uh, they do U-turns. And the reason you don't get uh, splattered like an egg up against the wall, any Star Trek fans know what gizmos they have on there? Inertial dampeners, I heard that, see? There's always some groupies out there, Kim, out there. Now for those of you who don't watch Star Trek, you have no idea what this in crowd's talking about, do you? What can I say, you need to get a life, all right. <laughs> Cosmic radiation is another problem. Uh, as we leave the Earth's atmosphere, uh, the dosage has increased. We're shielded somewhat by our atmosphere, and as your speed increases, the dosages increase. So as you spoke, approach the speed of light, you're going to get fried. But here's the single biggest problem with the idea you can warp yourself around the universe at multiple factors of light speed. Einstein theorised that the maximum speed of light, w uh, or the maximum speed within our universe, would be the speed of light itself. In fact, he's saying you could not attain the speed of light. So you physicists here, tell me, what increases as your speed increases, your mass, and it becomes exponential. You've got to keep using more and more speed, the fast, uh, more energy, the faster you go. So good demonstrable scientific evidence to show that this is correct. Okay, you will never attain the speed of light within our physical space-time universe. So I've been doing this, uh, researching this for over 20 years, and Pretty much when I started, the extraterrestrial hypothesis was the most favoured view. But because of the things I've told you, okay, they know that aliens cannot be visiting us in their faster than light spaceships. But there are these true religious UFO believers. No, aliens are still visiting us. People are having abduction experiences. How are they getting here? And they've come up with something called the interdimensional hypothesis. And this is the view that aliens might be visiting us from other realms or dimensions. And I think, and one of the reasons they've resorted to this, is this is what the evidence suggests. And I'm going to mention some of this to you. It overcomes the travel distance problem. And then people have these encounters with beings that call themselves or profess to be aliens. And they're told stories. And they say, no, we don't need spaceships. We've got these highly evolved spiritual type bodies. And we can kind of will ourselves around the universe uh, as we want. Now, I think. Yeah, you know, uh, from their point of view, they're on the right track. Of course, we would disagree about the origin. We're going to investigate that as we go along. Now, you know, many people say, well, it's all nonsense. Well, it isn't. And I can tell you, I come from a pretty conservative Christian background, and I was very confronted by, uh, by it all when I first started researching. I've now met hundreds and hundreds of people who've seen things, and dozens and dozens of people who've claimed they've been abducted by aliens. And uh, really, if somebody says, well, it's all hooey, then to be very frank, you're very ignorant about it because these people have been damaged and affected as a result of their experiences. So 
Uh, we do a disservice to kind of discredit their experience. But sometimes there are these mass sightings like that one there in Mexico City, 1997. These metallic looking objects down, uh, hovered in downtown Mexico City. Dozens of video cameras seen by thousands of people. And when you see that, immediately say, well, the government must know what it is, right? <laughs> well, governments don't tend to be candid about things they can't explain. Okay? The Mexican government's actually always been, one of the strange ones, been very candid. They say, yeah, here's, here's the footage. We've got it in the movie. You'll see uh, footage from uh, the Mexican Air Force that they released to the press. And they just said, we don't know what it is. In America, we tend to say we can neither confirm or deny because we like to appear in control. <laughs> Washington, 1952. This event here where some lights buzzed the Capitol Dome, uh, flew over Washington, uh, resulted in the largest gathering of the press since World War II. Again, in the movie, you'll see the, uh, the press conference, a clip of the press conference there. We tracked down a radar operator and featured him in the movie. He's in his 80s now. He says, listen, we, we know how to track flocks of birds. He said these things appeared over two separate weekends. They flew at incredible speeds, over 7,000 miles per hour. They merged into one another, became one object, disappeared. The Air Force was dispatched. And when the Air Force went up, they just vanished into thin air. The Air Force landed and out they came again. They played cat and mouse with our military. Uh, Roswell, if you've heard of Roswell, the little town in New Mexico, uh, the holy grail of ufology. Every July 4 weekend, the town doubles in size <laughs> as people go there looking for meaning and purpose. Ufology has become a substitute religion. If those aliens are older than us on the evolutionary scale, they're wiser. And if they seeded life on Earth, they can tell us where we come from. Maybe they can tell us what's going to happen to us when we die. They're religious questions, aren't they? Um, crop circles, don't have time to talk about it tonight, fully covered in my book. Nothing mysterious, they're made by men, but strange supernatural phenomena seems to accompany their construction in the same way that people mess around with Ouija boards and, and tarot cards. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, I think I'm one of the well, at the time, my first time there, I definitely know I was the only Bible-believing creationist ever to go and talk at the annual UFO Roswell convention. And um, there's my youngest daughter, Carla, standing next to a Coke machine. Ever seen one like that before? The street lamps there. Uh, even the McDonald's there is built in the shape of a flying saucer. Multinational organisations have piggybacked on it. 40-foot grey inflatable aliens stood outside the Toyota dealership, etc. It's big business, and uh, it's in their interest to perpetuate it and keep it going, for example. So science fiction, now I love science fiction, but I point out it is science fiction. It's science fantasy. We love it because it's got futuristic ideas. We're always fascinated by the future. But, you know, look at this. This is just some of the movies, and I did this in about two minutes. Um, science fiction accounts generally at any time anywhere between 70 to 90 percent of the highest grossing movies of all time. It is the number one most popular entertainment genre. In fact, who can tell me which sci-fi movie has just overtaken Avatar as number one? That young man, there you go. What is it? Avengers Endgame. Avengers Endgame, that's right. <laughs> uh, Star Trek Next Generation, which I've been joking about, I think still to this day it's the most syndicated TV show on our planet. That's how big this stuff is with all of these themes about older, more advanced aliens, etc. Now, we're going to take a bit more of a, a spiritual turn in our talk tonight because, as I said, people do have experiences. And even as Christians, you've got to be careful about opening the door in this area. Uh, this lady claimed to be a Christian. She's an artist. And she contacted me when she heard I was writing a book so exciting to hear another Christian being involved in this. And her artwork says, well, aliens really did visit us. And the Bible records their visitations. You know, UFOs parted the Red Sea. Elijah was raptured into a flying saucer. Moses was spoken to in the burning bush. From a, it's a radio transmitter beamed down from the mothership. She actually got those ideas from a Presbyterian minister by the name of the Reverend Dr. Barry Downing. And... Uh, he believes that God's created all this life all over the universe. She also said she, uh, she came to these beliefs because she had an experience. She would said some entities appeared in her room one night and they told her that Jesus was an alien. He was one of them. 
and that the Bible writers, primitive Bible writers, you know, those miracles that they thought were miracles were really as a result of advanced technology. The reason Jesus could, you know, raise the dead, turn water into the wine, not because he was the creator, it was because of his advanced technology. So again, you can see how this subtly undermines, you know, our, our history in the Bible, what we believe. Now, some of you might remember a movie years ago, Steven Spielberg's third movie, uh, after he made Jaws and hit the big time, he made a movie called Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Okay, so uh, a very, you can watch it on Netflix or something like that. Um, at the end, the flying saucer lands and a, a man walks in and he gets taken off to some utopian paradise. But in the movie, the lead investigator was based on a real person. And his name was Dr. Jacques Vallée. He was a Frenchman, if some of you can remember the movie. He's probably written more books on UFOs than anybody else. And Spielberg was paying homage to him and another man I'll show you in a moment as a result of their research. And this is back in 1977, Vallée said, Belief in the reality of UFOs is spreading rapidly at all levels in society throughout the world. He said books and periodicals appear at an ever-increasing rate. He said uh, they were authored by people of the UFO generation, people like Spielberg, for example, who were born just after World War II and who have moved into influential positions in the media. Um, Paul Allen, one of the co-founders of Microsoft, was going to have his own telescope array named after him at SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. If you've got a Hewlett and Packard computer or printer, they've donated money to SETI, uh, etc. Here's the other man, a contemporary of Dr. Vallée. His name was Dr. J. Allen Hynek. Uh, on the History Channel, they've just finished a dramatization of his life in a series called Blue Book. He investigated UFOs for the US government for 20 years, and he became a little disenfranchised in the fact that everything had to be explained naturalistically. You ever heard of the swamp gas idea? Oh, it's swamp gas, he invented it. It's a load of baloney, basically. It's to put people off the track, and he did that uh, as a result of government pressure. But he left and started his own UFO organization simply because he thought there was something there that we needed to investigate. And I have a lot of time for, for Dr. Vallée. He's deceased now. But look what he said, and this didn't make him very popular with his contemporaries, by the way. He said, certainly the phenomenon has psychic aspects. I don't talk about them very much because to a general audience, the words psychic and occult have bad overtones. They say it's all crazy, but the fact is there are psychic things. UFOs materialize, dematerialize, people had experiences, etc. And he says there's been reported cases of precognition, where people had a forewarning that they were going to see something. But here's the big thing, he says there's been a change of outlook, a change of philosophy of person's lives. That's a change of their worldview. He says those are rather tricky things to talk about openly, but it's there. Many people like Jacques Vallée and I feel to some extent it might be a conditioning process. Bingo. That's what I found. People who've had these experiences are very difficult to reach. You can't walk up and say, well, I think it's this, I think it's that. You didn't have the experience. I did. Don't tell me what it was. I had it, I know what it is, you see? It's the experience that has changed their worldview. Now, Heineck used terms like psychic and paranormal and paraphysical. Uh, as Christians, what terms might we use perhaps to describe the same phenomena? Spiritual. Spiritual. Yeah. Supernatural, perhaps, right? I mean, you know, you can't lasso a UFO and, and bring it in. Uh, we're only basically seeing these things and as I said, they appear and disappear. So the interdimensional hypothesis, I think, as I said, is on the right track. They start to realize that they're dealing with something more supernatural. And the Bible, of course, if we use that, okay, to interpret what's going on, tells us we've had supernatural visitors, doesn't it? Okay, good angels, bad ones. And one very important visitor, that was the Lord Jesus Christ himself. When he stood before Pilate, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is from another place. He might be a good source to listen to, I think, in trying to determine where this is coming from. And the same Lord Jesus warns us in Matthew 24, he said, false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that's possible. Who's the elect he's talking about? That's the church. Be careful of signs and wonders, even, in some respects, unless they line up with scripture. Could, could he be referring to this modern 
UFO stuff that appears miraculously. You know, the nature of UFOs, which technically are just unidentified flying objects, they've been seen throughout history. They're not something new. The ancient Romans and Greeks saw them. American Indians have stories of flying canoes. In fact, in the movie, you'll see we have some testimony from Alexander the Great that said he saw flying shields that attacked his army. And these things always seem to appear within the cultural understanding of the day. The modern idea that these are technologically advanced spaceships is a recent phenomenon. They've appeared and people have encounters with all sorts of strange beings in the past, including fairies and so on. Now you just imagine, I mean, if a, an entity stood at the bottom of your bed uh, in the middle of the night and it said, well, I'm a fairy. Well, you would doubt your own sanity. But guess what, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, fairies were pop culture. Today an entity stands at the bottom of someone's bed and he says, I've chosen you, you're special, I've got a mission for you. And that's a life-changing experience for someone because they're already open to the idea that aliens can travel vast distances and polls claim that up to 4 million Americans have been abducted by UFOs. Did you know that? By aliens, rather. 4 million Americans. Yeah. Well, you can laugh, but I tell you, in the movie, uh, you'll see an interview with a man named John Mack, Pulitzer Prize winning author, professor of Harvard Medical School, and he's interviewed on the Oprah show. And he said, I was a skeptic. He said, I uh, thought all these people were crazy, and he says, I started to research them from a medical point of view uh, in, his, in his field. And then what he found out is these people had no connection to each other, they were all over the country, and they were all having very similar experiences. And he says, as a medical professional, I tell you, the only thing that presents itself the way that it does is real experience. Fantasy, lies don't present itself. And he actually became a believer that something was going on. And then later on, I've got another interview with him. You see him, he's being interviewed by another PhD psychologist, and they're talking on screen. And listen to this, an atheistic professor of Harvard Medical School. He turns around and he says, what we are dealing with are spirit beings who have crossed over from their realm into ours. How about that? Remember I told you that the way the evidence is actually presenting itself is what has led them to the interdimensional hypothesis. Uh, they've been seen on radar by multiple credible witnesses. They can materialise, dematerialise, change shape, merge into one another. Electrical outages, disturbances, just like in the movie Close Encounters. Give you an example. There's one in New Mexico. They call it that classic cigar shape. And the reason is, is we're only seeing it in a two-dimensional uh, plane, obviously. They never make any noise. They travel at incredible speeds. Uh, again, in the movie, you'll see uh, some testimonies from Air Force officers, okay, not just enlisted personnel, at the Washington Press Club in 2010. 80 of them got up one by one and gave their testimonies about these craft being tracked interfering with our, our nuclear missiles, etc. Yep, all this is going on around us. And of course, we're oblivious to it all because uh, obviously, uh, as I said, the government want to appear in control. So how do we determine it? Well, secular researchers, and I found it's useful myself, use a, a, a set of markers known as the classic abduction syndrome. And there are eight markers. Not everybody has all eight experiences. Some of them might be two or three, but they usually fall within this grouping. First, there's a capture, and that means, you know, they're driving their car at night, they see some lights, and they stop, and then that's the last thing they remember. Or they're in the remote room and they see something, last thing they remember. They wake up hours later, the clock on the dashboard is gone, and they cannot remember anything that has happened during that missing time. And this is missing time is a real key. There was, in fact, a whole book written on that subject. And here's one of the problems. They remember something about UFOs and aliens, so then they go off to a UFO research center. The world's largest group is here in the United States called MUFON, Mutual UFO Network. They have field investigators in just about every city and town across America. And then sometimes what'll happen is they'll get hypnotically regressed. And they're trying to recover memories that occurred during this missing time. That's where some of the problems actually occur. And then when they do, they say they've got these stories about being on board a spaceship, oops, sorry, uh, having a conference with beings there, getting taken on a tour in the spaceship, 
uh, going to other planets. They claim there's a theophany. This is very common. They meet divine beings on the ship, including people like Muhammad, um, Buddha, and Jesus Christ. Apparently they're all living in peace and harmony together and us fuddy-duddy Christians have got to get rid of our old ways and embrace the new age. That's the message coming from them, <coughs> etc. And here's another thing. Uh, they often don't have any conscious recollection, sorry, as I said, but they even have some physical markings. They show shine signs of being interfered with. Let's think about that for a moment. If we're talking about fallen angels here, right, masquerading, when angels appear in the Bible, how do they appear? Physically. They eat food. They can interact with our environment. They can change our weather. They can kill people. So certainly they have physically interacted with human beings. They have that potential. Uh, when you talk about people who have been abducted, as I said earlier, they say they pass through the walls and the ceilings. They, they're paralysed. They don't have any control over the situation. And the stories are actually very similar. People have often wondered about out-of-body and near-death experiences. Here's a little bit of information you don't hear. You know when people have these out-of-body experiences and they're on the operating table and they claim they're seeing themselves above their body and they see the white light. Very common, they say they see their deceased relatives on the other side. But did you know this? They're often standing next to aliens. Don't ask me. I have no idea. But that's very, very common. And obviously that can't physically ha be happening and be true. So it indicates the nature of the deception, what's going on. So I'm going to use some hostile witnesses here. So these are people who are experts and a lot of them have written books and uh, professional, professionals like this lady here, Donna Higby. Um, she uh, has hypnotically regressed hundreds of these people who've had these experiences. So don't have to believe little Joe Christian here. You have a look at what they say. She said, I noticed a drastic change in the attitude of several of the abductees from one meeting to the next. People who've been traumatized all their lives by ongoing abductions had only anger and mistrust for their non-human abductors. And they started saying that they've been told or shown that everything that happened to them was for their own good and that the abductors are highly spiritual beings helping them to evolve spiritually. By the way, when they say it's for their own good, that's to try to counter the terrible things that happen to people. I'm not going to mention it here, but it, some of it is very disturbing and sordid. And people suffer PTSD uh, symptoms after their experiences. She goes on and she says, by accepting this information, the abductees stopped fighting abduction and instead became passive and controlled. She says, when I checked with other researchers, I found this was a pattern repeating itself over and over again around the country. I became concerned that abductees were accepting these explanations from entities that we know can be deceitful. Mm. We know can be deceitful. So, so much for the idea that these are highly evolved benevolent beings overseeing our revolution. They stealthily abduct people in the middle of the night and subject them to a traumatic medical experiments and the people are traumatised. By the way, when she says became passive and controlled, that's a medical phenomenon known as Stockholm Syndrome. Have you heard of that? It's where people get kidnapped, isolated in a room. And what happens is the reason they suddenly now become aligned with their abuser's cause, it's the isolation of the experience. I mean, who else have they got to talk to? You know, in the same way, it's uh, just imagine you've had this experience in your room, you've been, you've been terrorised and abused by these alleged benevolent aliens, it's not exactly something you can go and talk around the water cooler at work about tomorrow, is it? And so guess what? The only people those victims relate to are the ones that are doing the abusing to them. We see that same relationships uh, in human beings as well. Uh, this man here, John Keeley, he wrote a lot of books on this subject. Uh, one of them was made into a movie called The Mothman Prophecies. But again, listen to his wording for someone who's not a believer. He says, the devil and his demons can, according to the literature, manifest themselves in almost any form, can physically imitate anything from angels to horrifying monsters with glowing eyes. Strange objects, entities materialise, just as the UFOs and their splendid occupants appear, disappear, walk through walls and perform other supernatural feats. He said, demonology is not just another crackpotology. Thousands of books have been written on the subject many of them authored by educated clergymen, scientists and scholars, and uncounted numbers of well-documented demonic events are readily available to every researcher. Let me just stop there. 
readily available to every researcher. But guess what? When people go off to one of those UFO research centres, that's conveniently left out. <laughs> See, people are only getting half the story, aren't they? You know what? When you tell someone only half the truth, <laughs> it's a half lie, to be honest. It's a bit like, you know, if you only teach people evolution, that's all they're going to believe. And yet there's this incredible wealth of evidence out there that contradicts that particular view. He goes on and to say uh, that it's an imposing literature, there's m that much of it, and then he says the e episodes are identical to the UFO phenomenon itself. Victims of possession suffer the very same medical and emotional symptoms as UFO contactees. You know, a wise man once wrote, there's nothing new under the sun. And that's what this is. Now we have to be careful of oversimplifying this because we're talking in terms of the hundreds of, ex of sightings that people have, a very small percentage. We only go to the supernatural when the actual evidence itself demands it, when the craft defy natural laws or people have these experiences and they're told stories about aliens being our creators and so on and so forth. You see, the Bible is the history book of the universe. Creation evolution is a debate about history. But the Bible is unlike any other history book because this one can tell the future. Remember I said God's outside of time. He can tell us what's going to happen. I mentioned a couple of passages there where he gave us a heads up about some of the things we might see. But you know, even as creationists, although we, we deal in the area of science, I think we have a very simple and straightforward view of the scriptures, which I encourage. Don't overcomplicate things. Use the Occam's razor approach to scripture, right back there in the very first book, the first deception took place. What does it mean to be deceived? It means you're going to be conned into believing something that's not true. And right there, the first man and woman were deceived. Right? Ye shall be as gods, as the old King James puts it. Okay? And it says there that a being, Lucifer, which actually the term Lucifer means being of light. I don't know if you're aware of that. Bible also indicates he masquerades as an angel of light in the New Testament, deceived the first man and woman. And then in 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, it says, The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. See, the experiences can be really powerful. And if you ever meet anybody like this, never deny the experience. The experience can be real, but where you can unpick it is what were you told? Because I tell you what, what they're told is a lies. And that's the easiest way to unpick what's happening. Well, they claim they're highly evolved benevolent beings. Why would they lie to you? Why would they demonstrably tell you things that we know are not true? And that's what the secular researcher said, remember? You know, Dr. Vallet again, I think he hits it on the head here. He says, I propose the hypothesis, remember he's not a believer, <laughs> that there is a control system for human consciousness. But what takes place through close encounters with UFOs is control of human beliefs. Control of the relationship between our consciousness and physical reality. I'd say control of our spirit or our, our soul, if you like, and physical reality. He said, this control has been enforced throughout history and it's of secondary importance that now assumes the form of sightings of space visitors. Hmm. You know, in the movie I interviewed one of the more modern UFO gurus. His name is Nick Redfern. He's written over 40 books. He's been on the UFO hunters and ancient aliens and all that type of stuff. And I tell you, what a great time I had with him. Uh, you would have thought he was a Christian the way he's talking, but he's not. He was resistant to uh, our witnessing to him. But look what he wrote. He said, there's the nature of the entities themselves. They practically overemphasize who or what they claim to be. We only have to take a careful look at such cases to see that these incidents are stage managed. It's a game, a scenario that has everything to do with trying to emphasize the ET meme. Of course they could easily avoid us, but here's the deal. They want to be seen. It's not an accident, it's carefully planned and it's designed to plant an image of ET scientists in the minds of the witnesses. There you go. You see, you know, when uh, the movie came out, I received hundreds and hundreds of emails and a lot of them from kind of lay UFO believers, the real true UFOs, they, they believe it's more spiritual in nature. 
and they would say things like, well, that's typical of you Christians. You're trying to shoehorn it always into your Christian beliefs. I think when you watch the movie, we interviewed more non-Christians than Christians. And I'd say, well, it's not us you have a problem with. <laughs> it's your own guys. It's the evidence itself of how it appears that suggests it's spiritual in nature and it's deceptive. Why would you want to trust it? You see, it's a great witnessing tool. Because what we're doing is we're showing people there is a spiritual dimension to our universe and, ex and, and existence. How can evolution account for that? It can't. But the Bible's history said there's always been a spiritual realm, hasn't there? And it's always told us that there's been a war going on in the spiritual realms in the heavenlies. And Paul warns us in Galatians there, he says, even if we, this is amazing, isn't it? Or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we've preached to you, let him be eternally condemned. There's a heads up that fallen angels might come and preach another gospel to us. Well, what about the idea that God could have created life on other planets? You know, people often say, well, Gary, you can't say that uh, there's no aliens because, you know, the Bible's silent about them. Well, respectfully, if you argue that, that's an argument from silence. Because <laughs> if the Bible's silent about something, you can't argue for its existence, right? But I believe if we look at the big picture, the purposes of the gospel, we could unpick this question. First thing, I, I want to refer to Genesis 1.28. Uh, for those of you who are creation, creation groupies, you'll know we call this the dominion mandate. God told man, go and fill the earth, go and subdue the earth. He, he made us the bosses here. So just imagine, as I said, there's about 150 sightings every day. And even if 10% really were, you know, visitors from another planet that God created, when they get here by virtue of their advanced technology, wouldn't they be breaking that dominion mandate? Because they'd have kind of dominion over us in a way, wouldn't they? So that doesn't make sense. But let's look at the big picture. You know, in the New Testament, Romans 8, that famous passage says, the whole creation groans and travails under the weight of sin. You know, back in Genesis 1.1, the heavens and the earth, we believe that's a grammatical phrase known as a merism. A merism is when you describe the two opposing ends of the subject matter to, you know, to indicate its entirety. Let me give you an example. Hey, tomorrow, let's paint this building from top to bottom. Top's one end, bottom's the other end, but you understand that I'm saying, let's paint everything. Heavens and earth, everything God created. The same heavens and earth, are reserved for destruction. So the reason I'm mentioning that is there are no unfallen parts of the universe. Okay? If that's the uh, mothership, just tell them I'll be up in a minute. All right. So if God had created life on other planets, they would be affected by Adam's curse. The curse is universal. That's why God has to make a new heavens and earth. <laughs> Sorry, is the talk boring you? Someone give him a nudge. They ran out of memory. Ah, oh, okay. All right. So, um, you know, poor old Mr. Spock, he's sitting on the planet Vulcan and Vulcans get cancers, diseases and they die. Why? Because of what Adam did here on earth. That kind of wouldn't be really fair to them, would it? When God came to this earth, his plan was to redeem mankind. He became human. That's why the Bible in Isaiah calls him our kinsman redeemer. He came and there were the passages for you, not only humans, but his creation back to himself. The church, we're going to be Christ's bride throughout eternity. You know, is he going to have lots of brides out, out there, for example? I think the, you know, the idea of a, you know, one bride for the groom is symbolic of that monogamous relationship that uh, God created, the family unit in Genesis. You've got to also be a physical descendant of Adam to be saved. If you're sitting out there and you're a closet Klingon, I'm sorry you don't qualify for salvation. Bible says Jesus was the last Adam, not the second by the way, the last Adam because there was a real physical historical first Adam. Summing up, the heavens are going to be destroyed by a fervent heat. So aliens, potentially, that God created sitting out there, they get affected by the curse, they die for no fault of their own, and they can't get saved at the end because they're not descendants of Adam. You know, if that was the case, 
hypothetically, I think that would make God unjust. And it's something he's not. You know, to make sentient, intelligent, and I'm talking about morally self-aware beings in the order of human beings. Beings that can ask the big questions and can develop, you know, incredible technologies. You know, we're the type of beings that say, where did we come from? What's it all about? That's our nature. To create them without that hope of salvation and to suffer the opprobrium of the curse uh, would be unjust. And uh, 1 Peter 3.18 says, Christ died for sins <laughs> once for all. He's not going to be crucified and raised again on other planets. The Bible's big picture discounts the idea of sentient, intelligent, alien life. You know, a man said to me once, he says, the purpose of creation was to bring forward a bride for Christ. I think so. So whenever I mention that, I've been doing it long enough to know that some Christians sit out there and go, even though I've mentioned all the scriptures, <laughs> yeah, I'm still not sure. You know, it's the but clause, right? It's, it's, I often husbands and wives talk to each other and say, but don't do that. All right. <laughs> the reason I've learned is why would God have made the universe so big just for us? You know, just for this little rocky planet that's not even a speck of dust in the vastness of the universe. You know, the, surely he must have made something else out there. Well, really, if we say that, we're kind of anthropomorphizing God. We're putting kind of our understanding onto the creator of the universe, making him in our image. This picture, by the way, uh, downloaded from the Hubble telescope, is one of the most popular NASA have ever made. This is the Eagle Nebula. It's one light year in length, just a speck in our universe. 9.7 trillion kilometers in length, that, right, that gas cloud. <laughs> and it's just the dot. Remember I said I have a simple view of the Bible? The Bible tells us why the universe is the way it is. It declares his glory. There are lots of passages like that. You see, I think people look up and they go, wow, I wonder what else is out there. They're telling us the universe is the way it is. You should look up and say, my God, my God, what is man you are mindful of him? You know, I think it makes the miracle of salvation that much more pertinent that that incredibly, incomprehensibly powerful creator did choose this little rocky planet to make life. And when it went wrong, he stepped out of heaven and became one of us to rescue us back from the clutches of the evil one. See, only the creator can have the power to save you. And I'm not demeaning the experiences people have, their real experiences, but you know, to be very honest, no one who's been on the spaceship has ever brought back a towel from the bathroom or a souvenir from the ship. It's happening in the spiritual realm. The Word, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the Eternal One, Jesus, became flesh, made His dwelling among us. We've seen His glory, the one of only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's the Creator that we're talking about. And as I said, we can use the Bible as a source to find out uh, what is going on. Um, in the website, I have one more bit of information, by the way, I think it's going to kind of blow you away, but I want to do something in between. Um, you'll see uh, at the bottom on the site map, uh, most asked questions or FAQ, there's a whole section on aliens there uh, you can get to. But uh, I want to talk about Creation Magazine. Um, Ken asked how many of uh, you get it. This gentleman here said that's the best thing, so he was already prompting me. But this is a family magazine. When I mention these resources, I, I mentioned at the, the beginning why we focus on them. Uh, we encourage you to read them and equip yourself and then hand them out. Answer people's questions with the resources. If you're not sure of the answers, you can look up the information. We don't have any advertising in our magazine. You can imagine in 42 years there's been a few requests, but we, d we don't accept it, so hand on heart we can stand in churches and promote it faithfully as an equipping resource. I'll give you an example, it's all lay information. Here, uh, this piece of rock, we know the age of the rock from the volcanic explosion was 50 years, and we sent that out to Radiometric Dating Lab and it came back with an age of 1.35 million years. So when people think you can do scientific tests, you know, to uh, determine the age of the earth. We get all these testimonies on the magazine over the years, thousands of them. This young man was on his way to be becoming one of those uh, statistics of youth leaving the church. 
And he says, at first I shunned the belief of my parents, but after living on my own for two years with the aid of a copy of your magazine, I was given one day. See how somebody gave it to him and passed it on? And I realized I was wrong and I asked for salvation. He got information he was not going to hear in the public realm. Hence, sharing it about. I love this one. This was, uh, I'll never forget, this was an American lady who wrote to us. And she says, uh, the magazine creation is the most educational and inspiring magazine I've ever had the pleasure to read. I'm 99 years old. I preach to people with your uplifting magazine. Isn't that amazing? She'll be encouraged by that. Actually, I remember it well because uh, I was so surprised she sent that to us by email. Anyway. <laughs> And uh, this young mum, she says, uh, some friends recently lent me a copy of your creation magazine. She says it encourages me a believer in Christ, <laughs> teaches her children, and she uses it to witness to her unbelieving friends. So just in the interest of time, because this is the number one resource you're going to get tonight, uh, we're going to pass around the sign-up sheets uh, now, and then you just bring them to the table. But uh, before Dan holds them out, let me show you what they look like. It's a form like this. You can get the magazine for one year. It's $29. And it's a great way, of course, keeping up with all the latest in creation and the latest in evolution, because we're always answering it. For two years, it's $50. And what we do when we go out on ministry, and you can't get this on the website, if you sign up tonight, we're going to give you the free, uh, the digital version for free. That's normally $19. So you get it by email from us and then we allow you to share it. You just forward the email and you can use it for evangelism, share it with your family or grandchildren, etc. So you also get our free newsletters. They come out monthly. Lots of teaching articles in that. And when you bring it to the tables for, uh, to pay for it tonight, you're going to get uh, the first edition, the current edition tonight. So you won't have to wait till it's posted. I've got some there and you can start reading straight away. So you get all that for one year. But if you sign up for two years, which is cheaper, $50, I'm going to give you a free DVD. And it's the first documentary we made called Darwin, The Voyage That Shook the World. And this is where we retraced his voyage on the Beagle. We went to the Galapagos in South America and interviewed evolutionists and creationists and intelligent design people and simply asked the question, if Darwin knew today what we know about science, how do you think he would have fared? Would he, would he, would he have been an evolutionist, basically? And now I mentioned that survey I did on college campuses in the South, where we interviewed hundreds of students uh, who were raised in the church as to whether creation or evolution is true, and we could only find a handful that still believed in creation, and then we explored why. And what was interesting when, uh, and I mentioned this in the church um, uh, on Sunday morning, uh, you'll see in the documentary, I, I asked them, I said, what was your best evidence for evolution? What do you think makes evolution for true? And over 90% of them said the fossil record. The fossil record. The easiest thing for us to explain as creationists, you know, in light of Noah's flood. You've got Mike Ward coming, and he's an expert in that area. And uh, so easy, I found, when I sit down and explain to people the, the order of burial in the rocks, the types of rocks, it's consistent with Noah's flood, not millions of years of evolutionary process. So I'm going to give you those two DVDs for free. You get the current issue, you get the free digital. The gifts are actually worth more than the subscription price. Uh, itself. So Dan, if you want to pass those around. So uh, make, could just give everyone an opportunity to get it. Tear it off, bring it to me at the table, and I'll give you your free gifts there as well. Here's one of the most famous articles we ever produced in Creation Magazine, the Two-Tone Twins. Remember how I showed you the dog's example? It's a case of selection. All humans have the same skin colour, which is a brownish pigment called melanin. It codes for our hair, codes for our eye shade as well. And guess what? The parents, they're in the medium brown range of melanin. Years ago when I first got involved in creation, they, they used to say, well, Adam and Eve probably were medium brown skin, medium brown hair, medium brown eyes. I think it's been validated by modern genetics. Adam and Eve would have had lighter skin children and darker skin. And lots of melanin is a survival advantage in hot climates, which is why when Captain Cook visited Australia, he saw dark-skinned Aboriginal people there, because guess what? Fair-skinned people like me and like down under, we suffer the highest rates of skin cancer in the world. We get skin cancers, we die, we don't pass our genes on to the next generation. It's the same thing going on. There's the girls growing up today. You know, genetically, and uh, some of you would know, we are more than 99% similar, genetically, our DNA. 
the alleged racial differences are less than 1% of our genome. That's the library of instructions. If uh, you're new, we have some packs out there. They're wrapped in plastic and you get, basically get you know, three resources for the price of two, the answers book, and Refuting Evolution, the largest selling creation book of all time, and a DVD. But because you're a creation group, I brought extra of these along tonight. If you do not have a copy of the answers book, may I just be bold to say you need one. Because if you want to be informed creationists, this answers the 65 most asked questions on creation evolution, which is why we call it the answers book. And there's a free study guide online you can use. Where did the water come from from the flood? Where did the water go? What about distant starlight, millions of light years away? How do we see that in a young creation? So what I'm doing with you guys tonight, if you buy one, $14, I'm going to give you one free. Why am I doing that? What do I want you to do with the second one? <laughs> give it away. Hey, that's it. All right. Evolution's Achilles Heels, which Ken... I mentioned book and DVD. This has actually won two Christian Film Awards. Very, very powerful. In all my nearly 30 years of ministry, the most powerful critique I think I've ever seen of evolutionary uh, theory. Uh, the Genesis Account by Dr. Jonathan Safady. His magnum opus, 800-page theological, scientific, and historical commentary on Genesis 1 to 11, the uh, most comprehensive book you can get. Uh, Mike, we're publishing a lot of Mike Ward's books now, uh, and uh, our American office is the, is the publisher for CMI. This is one of his latest, How Noah's Flood Shaped Our Earth. The continents we have today came about because of the flood. Uh, this book is a fantastic book, uh, really for kind of middle school and above, and I encourage adults to do it. It teaches you about evolution, but it teaches you the creation answers along the way. There's even exams and questions for review. Very pictorial, a good history. Uh, again, a new book, The Deep Time Deception. If there's no millions of years, right, as I said yesterday morning, there's no time for evolution. There's no time for mutations to turn apes into human beings. The time issue of the Bible is critical. I know many of us have tried to add millions of years. I can tell you there is no need to. The Earth is not 4.5 billion years old, and there's scientific evidence to suggest that. Particularly when we're, you know, carbon dating dinosaur bones that are supposed to be 65 million years old, and we get carbon-14 in it, which can't last more than 100,000 years. Coal sent off to carbon-14 labs. I was taught it was 380 million years old, and there's carbon-14 in it. And a uh, couple more. Okay, the Genesis Academy, this is brand new. It's been out a couple of weeks. It's a 12-part DVD teaching series on Genesis 1 to 11. Six speakers, free study guide online. No session is more than 40 minutes. Very, very highly produced. Lots of great graphics, etc. And then out there, there are some of my DVDs. And there's one about the new heavens and earth. And if you wanted a church talk, like I gave yesterday morning, that's a two DVD set uh, for $10. And that's that creation survival guide book that I mentioned. And the alien intrusion book is there. And also the movie, which has been out now for years on a thousand theatres around the world as well. And that one is a specialist DVD. When these people have been on board a spaceship, the claim, how can they tell you the colours of the walls and give you a description of the ship if it didn't really happen? And uh, there's a medical phenomenon known as false memory syndrome that can be induced by uh, hypnosis, and that's what I've been kind of researching. And the book comes out in a pack uh, as well, where you can get a book and a DVD. Last thing, sorry, Ken, and then I'm done. All right. You're a creation group, so I thought you'd want more information. In the movie, I tell the story of two UFO researchers, okay, secular UFO researchers, and they said, instead of looking at who is being abducted by aliens, is there any significant group of people who aren't? And they went through all their research and then they found out that some people in their terrifying abduction experience were calling out on the name of Jesus Christ and the abduction was stopping. So they went, wow, aliens don't like Christians. Okay, why? And they contacted their colleagues in MUFON and around the world and they would all knew about it and they ignored it. So they said, well, we think we're on to something. So they took themselves off to a local church and enrolled in a Bible study class to try to find out 
what it was about aliens, uh, Christians that aliens didn't like, so they thought. <laughs> and they went back through all their research and they discovered that not only were people calling on the name of Christ, that some people had just become Christians, they sang, prayer, sang hymns or prayers in their moment of terror, and it stops. You know, as I said to you at the beginning, this was very confronting to me. But imagine these guys who are non-Christians encountering all this. Well, guess what happened to them? They got saved. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> they got saved. And uh, one of them is this gentleman here, right in the middle, Joe Jordan. He's become a good friend of mine. He now lives in South Korea. He is the national director for MUFON in South Korea. He's a big cheese in MUFON. And he's a Bible-believing Christian, uh, just like me and a fellow collaborator in this. And it was the evidence of what he looked at that turned him on, made him a believer. As I said, this is an exciting subject to reach people with. For those of you who've seen the movie, it is a bit like a sci-fi movie as a documentary at the same time. So I encourage you to, 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 to grab it. It's mainstream belief that there's aliens out there and that they even created life on Earth now. Back to you, Ken. Thank you. Thank you.